Um, yes, hello, I'm Diana Siegelberg and I'm the Deputy Director at Somerset House in London. And for those of you who don't know Somerset House, we today are a centre for cultural innovators, but uh, our origins are as a historic building and it's 500,000 square feet of Grade 1 listed space, which until uh, the late 90s was a home for different government offices and departments, including the Inland Revenue. Today it's a home for artists and I think it's that journey um, that we'll be talking about a little bit later. Thanks, I'm Stuart McLeod, I'm one of the uh, area directors of the National Lottery and Heritage Fund. I cover, uh, sort of head up our business across um, London, the South East and South West of England, so a large patch. Um, I suspect a number of you will know of us and who we are, but just in case you don't, uh, we're a distributor of the National Lottery Funds. Uh, we support projects we potentially seek to conserve and share uh, all aspects of heritage. Um, a kind of core part of what we find is, is how you engage community with whatever that direction might be. Um, in terms of what we mean by heritage, it's very broad in terms of definition. So we tend to be best known for things like funding of historic buildings and museums, but we also fund nature conservation <coughs> and by quantity, the vast majority of our funding is actually more to do with the uh, community aspect. And just briefly, I think I, I, I hope it's useful and relevant for you. Uh, since we've been in existence, we've uh, given grants totaling 27.5 million to uh, Southampton, the decision of breadth. Um, and just to give sort of some, some live examples for you, in terms of some of the larger grants, that would be things like Cities and Museum, Tudor House and Gardens, uh, St James's Park, and the, uh, the central parks as well, so all the green spaces that surround us here. So that's some of the more significant funding we've given, most recently, God's Hands Tower. Uh, we funded a lot of maritime archaeology projects, um, historic ships, shield and Medusa, but also a number of community grants as well. So this might mean something to some of you, uh, organisations like Cultural Media Enterprise, Art Asia and the French African Association. I'll probably be saying more about this. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mandy Lisa Cross and eight years ago we became custodians and this is part of our of the old traffic museum in Southampton by the Docks, which we uh, gave a very sympathetic uh, conversion and put in a brewery, two bars and a restaurant. So we are very, very proud and very lucky to be part of the the building. I think we called it alive and it's a good indication of what you can do with a beautiful space that's become our love and left for a few years. And we continue to do what we do best, which is bring fabulous and all living day. And we've got the full support of the um, people of the city and the local council. And well. Good afternoon. Hey. It only happens to me. My name is Don John, and I'm a race and diversity consultant. I used to be the director for the Race Quality Council in Southampton. I'm the founder of Black History Month. I'm involved in all kinds of stuff to do with the race, particularly in the arts, but I shall expand on that a little more when I do my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I say, an illustrious panel, a uh, vast amount of experience in that broad title that we have got for this uh, session, which is Developing Heritage. Two words which we could debate to the end of time. Um, so we will be developing those, and we're developing those ideas, and as Stuart alluded to, it's not just buildings we'll be talking about. So, we've got some questions, those of you who have been here this morning will know there's a bit of a format, uh, there are some questions that have been presented here, uh, we'll pose them to them, and then they'll each have a couple of minutes to respond accordingly, and then we will have a little bit more informality towards the end, and hopefully we'll get some questions and uh, some little pointers and advice from our panel. So, without further ado, how do we make the most of a diverse and rich heritage? Uh, yes, uh, well, I think you make the most of your diverse and rich heritage by uh, not expecting to have the plan overnight um, and by working out over time what is going to be relevant in terms of how you would re reinvent the heritage asset or culture that you're responsible for looking after. So in terms of Somerset House, what that meant for us was uh, slowly 
taking back the site wing by wing and floor by floor. And we didn't have uh, a master plan. I think there's lots of very good arguments for having a kind of master plan that you stick with, but I think you have to be prepared to iterate um, things as you go. So in Somerset House's case, we had a courtyard that had become a very convenient car park if you happen to, um, happen to work at the Inland Revenue. Uh, but it was a closed off space. And today, 20 years on, we get two and a half million visitors. Um, over that time, we um, tried numbers of different things. We borrowed collections from different organisations, and that worked for a period of time. But it's only really in the last 10 years that we've recognised that what we can do differently and uh, the specific needs that we can address is using our heritage, but creating a, a space for contemporary culture. So that means we've got the largest concentration of artists, creative technologists and makers and creative enterprises in the UK are based with Somerset House today. Um, I think another thing in terms of how you make the, the most of your diverse heritage is, is look back at what it meant before and find uh, a reinvention and reinterpretation for today. So a very basic example of that is that Somerset House began life as a Tudor palace, had an extraordinary uh, fountain there, which is in Cushion Park today in South London, and the original directors of the Somerset House Trust, a big fundraising campaign, and uh, managed to install these fountains, which today at Somerset House, in the summer holidays, is an incredible free oasis for families from across London that um, come and use it. Uh, Mia Williamson, one of the lionesses, talks about it, her memory of growing up and knowing that from Wembley, where she was brought up, you'd go to Somerset House with your whole family, it was somewhere you knew was free and you could enjoy it. But that was <coughs> echoing the historic um, fountains that had been there in the past. In more recent years, I think we've taken a more nuanced approach and recognised that Somerset House was built at the height of empire and at the height of British power as the home of the Royal Navy. And we lean into what that means and our responsibility in terms of the heritage that we've inherited. So today, we commission a lot of contemporary artworks by artists based in our studios to respond to what that means in terms of Britain's history today. Um, so that's a few points. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, uh, now, Stuart, you have a sort of very high level view of all heritage, don't you? So perhaps. Yeah, um, I think one of the things I was struck by this morning, the leader of the council was talking about. Um, this isn't about culture for culture's sake, and I'll say the same with heritage. So, with my with my funding hat on, I think to me making the most of of, of the heritage of the city here is really um, it's really about advocating for the power of heritage to transform life, transform communities and places. So, you know, what we're interested in with applications that come to us um, are making those connections with how heritage supports the local economy. It um, creates and develops skills, retains skills, creates employment, sports people well-being, creates pride in place. So making those kinds of connections, making the case for heritage, advocating the, the, the case with those kinds of connections we think is um, vital and real. Um, it's also, again, we, we heard this morning about this balance, uh, leadership balance between top down and bottom up. And again, I'd say empowering people to define for themselves what, what heritage is, to be able to have the uh, supported with the, uh, the skills and resources to be able to uh, research, investigate, identify the heritage and share it. Um, I think that's particularly important about that to the resourcing aspect. Um, I would also say that um, sort of thinking about who the, the main institutions are in the city that um, I guess most naturally have a leadership role in relation to what well, heritage in particular is what we need to talk about this afternoon. Is thinking about um, what's their role currently in terms of how they are engaging communities. Um, how outward facing are they? Is there is there more that they could be doing? So I, mean, I suppose I could I, I throw that out there, not knowing the answer to that, but almost a question back for uh, for the city. Is is there more that could be done in that point in terms of how communities are being engaged by those institutions that probably have been um, in most cases, you know, have some capacity to do something. Thanks, sir. Mandy, you've got a... The challenge is for us, uh, huge. Uh, one, the brand new business. 
uh, so we didn't know how that was going to go. And two, we've never dealt with anything to do with before, grade one, nothing at all. So it was a big learning curve for us. Um, and we found that the best way to deal with English heritage was to be totally honest, um, developed a relationship with our heritage officer at the time very quickly. Uh, I understood the rules. We kept saying things like, do you want to feel the fabric of the building, to press some really strange words, but you soon, once you're apart and you're inside that fantastic building, you soon um, realise you don't have to rip walls down, you don't have to do things, you have to be sympathetic in your design. So we, everything we've done, we haven't, the whole of the upstairs if you've been there is sat on two metal posts, huge posts. It's sat, it's away from the walls. We were given a, an award for the best design in the south for what we did. And that was only really possible with massive imagination, a fantastic building um, team, and the council support. They were the ones that came to us and said, we've heard you want to expand, we've got this building, come and have a look. And it grew from there with private funding and lots and lots of hard work, sleepless nights. The thing that does frustrate me a little bit is there are many, many wonderful sites in Southampton, not necessarily like the Walkhouse, but underground vaults and really odd little quirky places that we could utilise. And I'm hoping that with, for people like us, now that we have a track record, we can go into other cities and expand with similar type buildings because we're trusted, we love it, and we know what we're doing. So I, I wish more places were open or there was a body that could show us these places and then businesses could maybe take decisions on whether they want to be in them and even give ideas on how they could be for the use of yeah, so you can bring a slight demand to how yeah. the user building a space yeah. to be just to be open. Yeah, I think that, that's a very good point to make. Go on. Does it work? Yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> never know these days. I want to look at this question a little bit differently because I guess one of the things that um, I'm a bit confused about is we all have different interpretations of what heritage actually is. And for someone who was born in, in London, of African heritage, who lived most of my life in Southampton, I've got many different backgrounds to call on. Because you see, heritage should not just be a predetermined destination, a big discovery that allows us newer evidence to come through and to recognise that as part of the heritage. And sometimes we're so consumed with what we already know, that we choose to ignore parts of that heritage that is not consistent with our notion of what the destination should be. When we competed for the City of Culture 2025, I saw many great opportunities for the city to rediscover itself and draw upon its rich heritage, as Randy said, and, the, and that included Hamwick, Agincourt, the Spitfire, the Titanic, the Windrush Generation, and Tommy Cooper. And my work on the Black History of Southampton unearthed many aspects of the city's history. It was not only an education, but for me, but a revelation of the city. But there was a curious absence of that in the history of the city, notwithstanding the connection to the transatlantic slave trade. And we now know that there's a little bit more in that, and there's still so much more to uncover. Furthermore, I began to discover that Southampton was not only a city made up of different ethnic communities, but one thing we've not really examined, the city composed of different tribes, that is our heritage, from different regions. And the histories we really should be really proud of. Shirley, for instance. And I guess there are one or two people from Shirley here. Where a black man, Alexander Patterson, saved the life of a child from a horse and carriage in the early part of the century. To scores of black soldiers marching down Southampton High Street on Great Armistice Day in 1918. To the first black landlord in the turn of the century in central Southampton. 
and Wall Street with Buster Thorncroft and the development of the Spitfire. And St Mary's with his rich history, its association with the Saxon town of Hamwick and the long history of St Mary's Church with association with the grandson of William Wilberforce and colourfully diverse the ditches in the East Street, in the East Street area. And one thing I did discover, when we were going to you know, develop in the city of culture, I'm not sure how much we really developed and examined all of that stuff in defining what the city is. At the end of the day, the city is about the people of Southampton. And you see, all these districts, they should have equally memorable stories to tell. And we should have the means by which these stories can be collected and celebrated as a matter of civic pride, in a manner where we can all absorb these histories, the important ingredients of who we are as a city. And these stories, yes, heritage should be about stories, should not just be colourful and fanciful anecdotes, but an essential part of the city's past. I will develop it a bit further in the next question. I've got a long list of things to say, but I think that uh, we said it's cooking for a little bit. To talk about, was, I guess, my sense of what it seems to be to our city, sort of generically what we're seeing elsewhere, but also um, give it a little bit of a sense of how we're responding to that as a funder as well, because obviously the opportunity is always there to, to apply for funding. Um, I guess thinking in the macro level for the city, um, we heard this this morning about the huge challenge of the number of people that pass through um, as, as visitors who don't stay and you know, how, how you kind of get that dwell time. And um, you know, I, I've had very similar conversations with Dover. I mean, I know it's a different place, it's much smaller, but you know, again, a huge number of people passing through who just, just don't, other than going to the castle, they just don't stay. I had a conversation about it at lunchtime about Plymouth as well. So I guess there's, al there's always going to be um, competition as well locally, um, you know, with somewhere like Portsmouth down, down the road. Because I suppose, speaking entirely as a, as a visitor, my sense when I think about the heritage, built heritage of the city is, on the one hand, um, there is a, a historic core to Southampton, but it's also quite eroded. And again, you, know, you see that a lot around the country. That, that's a real challenge, because I think that affects um, the coherence of what you're presenting what the, the visitor offer then becomes. Uh, I, I suppose speaking I, you know, more broadly in terms of the current economic challenge, and it, I guess everywhere we've come from in recent years to create the, the conditions we find that we've got at the moment, uh, we're very, very aware that you know, everybody in, in this space of heritage and culture um, are, are, you know, are not immune from, from these challenges that we're facing right now. Thinking about our conversations with local authorities, uh, we're seeing them struggle with maintaining parks, um, keeping libraries and archives open and resourced and sustained, struggling to operate cultural venues, which then of course also has an impact in terms of uh, how equitable those kinds of venues are in supporting community participation. We're also aware, uh, Don talked about grassroots organisations, we're also aware of the, the huge challenge uh, on how broadly we might want to define those organisations. They're a vital part of the heritage ecosystem, the network. Uh, we see that they're struggling too. The other thing to add to that as well is that um, what we're used to seeing as a funder is there are what we, you know, sort of non-traditional organisations, maybe their focus is more education or the arts. Um, they're often a really, really important gateway for engagement in heritage. Those kinds of organisations, they've got some of the same struggles, but at the same time, when times are tough, they need to, they need to focus on their core business. That won't necessarily be engaging people in heritage. So you know, when you bring all these factors together, uh, we're, we're very um, mindful of the fact that there is, there is a real challenge at the moment. Which is why then, from, from our, our point of view as a funder, we're really, really concerned to make sure that we're funding financial, sorry, supporting financial sustainability in organisations. We're, in about a month's time, you'll see we're going to publish a new 10 year strategy, and one of the core, what we're calling investment principles, will be any grant that we offer needs to actually um, provide some sense of shoring up and supporting and, and, and giving that, that organisation the opportunity to be sustainable in, in the longer term. This seems to be, um, this, this is running through a lot of funding we're giving at the moment, so what people are asking us for. We want to really make that kind of a foundation of our, our funding going forward. 
Um, another thing to say is that um, although I, I wouldn't put Southampton in, in this particular boat, we also work in lots of places where there's very, very little um, cultural infrastructure. So part of our response as well from a funding point of view is um, we want to do more in the way of giving um, what you call third party grants, i.e. we give a sum of money to an organisation who can then distribute those locally. We're, we're talking to the local authority here about that, hopefully that's something that, that will um, happen in the new, uh, in the new financial year. Um, but what we're seeing increasingly is that our capacity to be able to service everybody's individual need is not necessarily the most effective way for us to operate. So we're hoping that um, going forward, as I say, a better model will be identifying those organisations who are uh, connected, uh, informed locally, have that reach that we wouldn't because we're always going to be a little bit removed, and hopefully that being uh, another way of making sure we're, we're able to be a bit more effective at supporting the level of need that we're seeing. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, and I, we exchanged a few words before we started, and I was involved in the HLF at the time funded organisation uh, project. And I do remember that part of the bid and the subsequent bid we put in, we had to have how we can keep this going for that five year, ten year viability, which is what we went to Diana as well. So it, what you were bringing that in after the day of just capital spend, move on, you had to show. And I remember we had to prove community engagement. How is it going to bring value to the community uh, of the town we were working in? Um, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody, for that. Um, we, we are, I still want some fun, by the way. Um, how do you get your fun in? Uh, some of you are more familiar with Southampton than others. Uh, our panel have come from far and wide as well as the neighbourhood. So this question is going to be a bit of a challenge, perhaps. <laughs> See? Um, but you, you've, you've been to Southampton, you've had a look around, you've seen it, you know something about it, you've obviously got a lot of connections in the town, the city. What are, in yours, I'm going to start with you there. What are the strengths of Southampton on this topic, and also using a bit of your own experience to illustrate that? Um, well, uh, I, well, I'm very lucky in that I am a, a newly arrived at New Southampton, so I'm now based just outside Winchester, and for the last okay. year or so, so I feel like I'm not discovering Southampton myself. I haven't been to Mandy's or venue yet, so I clearly need to clearly need to book that um, soon, but. Um, I suppose my uh, moving to the area, working in London, what I, has amazed me is that how little I feel I knew about Southampton before, because I am probably one of those people that has all my working life been in London, and I'm going to put my hand up and say I have not looked out or looked south to Southampton nearly enough, but um, it's a journey of discovery, and for example, next week at Somerset House, we're opening a major commission with the Indian artist called Jitish Kalat. And where, where in the UK was he last, or was he first? Southampton. I came to see him at the John Hansard Gallery next door um, at the end of last year. So uh, from that perspective, as somebody that is a kind of culturally curious person in my work, but in my life, I feel like there's so much more potential to get Southampton on the map for cultural visitors. And for some of the, the stories that you've just been sharing, Don, makes me realize well, how much more there is to discover, whether you're local or not. Sure. Yeah, um, I'm feeling like I'm maybe the one's guilty for not injecting enough fun so far. So. <laughs> Um, but I mean, honestly, I've said this to I said this to people like, over the lunch break. I, I um, when I was invited to come today, I had no idea how many people would be here, and I was really quite overwhelmed when I arrived. So I mean, you know, an obvious strength therefore is the fact that you've been through the city of culture the application process, but maintained momentum coming out of that, and that's why we're here today, is a huge strength. And um, I guess all the work that went into preparing that application, um, I, I was looking at cultural strategy before I before I came uh, today, and you know I, I get that sense that the city does really understand, um, uh, you know, th there is a vision for the city that's anchored, I guess, in uh, that sort of sense of identity. Um, of what's important, both in terms of the kind of historic fabric, uh, understanding uh, the, the communities. You know, that seems to be a real um, foundation um, of, of what I, I feel I've kind of picked up this morning as well. Um, Southampton obviously is a place of historical interest. You know, despite my comments about you know maybe some erosion of the, the kind of the built heritage, 
Nevertheless, um, what's also abundantly clear is that this is a city that's been shaped by this incredibly, the incredibly diverse communities that, that it has. And so I, I think maybe picking up on some of Don's themes from earlier on, that means that there are in, an enormous number of stories and perspectives and content, if you like, that I, I guess you, perhaps the city's barely begun to tap into. Um, when I was looking, some of the more sort of dry research I do um, when I'm invited to, to speak at these kinds of events is I look at what have we funded in the place so that I can actually, you know, talk from a from the perspective of having some feeling of where we have or haven't invested. Um, the, some of the briefing materials that came through to me um, pointed out the fact that in the last five years, um, in terms of funding for my organisation, Southampton's received about something like 1.5 million. Funnily enough, in the five to six years before that, that the city received about 15 million. So all of those projects I mentioned earlier on, the bigger sort of capital heavy projects, there was obviously a bit of a sweet spot about a decade ago in the city for, for reasons that I wouldn't necessarily know. That's really slowed up. But not only have we not been approached to invest in things like you know building restorations, etc., but actually I would say that the number of applications that have come through from community organisations has been really quite slow as well. For a city of your size, um, you know, we work on the basis of we, we use metrics which are looking at our um, what, what, what have we funded to a given place relative to the population? Now, the overall funding for the city is not too bad because of these larger capital projects. But if you strip those out, actually, I would say the funding that's gone to grassroots organisations here is really quite low. So, in a sense, you, you would be pushing an open door with us as a funder. If there are, you know, if there are those um, ideas out there, you know, please come and talk to us because we're, that those are the kinds of projects that we recognise we'd like to be supporting more. Just a few more things, if that's okay. Um, speaking more, more generally then about um, strengths that we've seen elsewhere, but strengths I'm seeing here, particularly today, is that having proactive, engaged cultural and heritage organisations is critical. Um, and that's what I've seen, that's what I've seen today. That includes having really strong relationships with the likes of the Arts Council, and you do, um, and, and with ourselves. We, we've got a really healthy relationship with the city council, I would say, um, and I think that's a, an important kind of building block really going forward. Um, we've, we've also seen elsewhere around the UK, strong networks and strong partnerships are also vital. And again, I've got that sense from being here today. I had it before, okay, but today's really kind of reinforced that for me. Uh, the, the, the kind of um, the heritage infrastructure here, I think, um, is, is good, can be built upon, can, can grow, but I think it's important that you do Again, probably through the city culture application process, perhaps that's been um, enhanced and that needs to be built upon further. Um, last but not least, I guess um, what we what we've definitely seen as being uh, a strength elsewhere around the UK is the extent to which investment in heritage really fosters a sense of pride and identity in a, in a given place. Um, I was looking at some of the materials produced through the Mayflower 400 program, which um, you know, was really very impressive, given that a lot of it was had to be delivered during lockdown, so a lot of activity switched online. So there's, I think there's some really great examples that we have seen over the years uh, here in, in the city. But um, I think the point was made to me in the briefing materials that I received that you know, Southampton is probably due a bit more of a share. Well, yeah, and, and therefore it kind of requires applicants to come forward. But like I say, the door, the door is open. And, uh, I think Southampton's in a good place at the moment, I think, in terms of um, attracting more, more inward investment, at least from the wider direction. Thank you, Stuart. I didn't know how to ask you how we get on here. Yeah. When I saw your name was on the panel, on the <laughs> when I saw the names on the panel, we had, and I just think, oh, that's it. People are going to expect to get lots of money from you, and you're the funder. Uh, there's the offer, folks. Um, please uh, get together and submit some bids. And look at the criteria, isn't it? I mean, I think it's very clear on your information about what the criteria are. Well, that, for those of you that don't really know us, um, there, there's a whole team of people within my team, uh, the engagement team, as we call them, and they're, they're absolutely there to, to work with support um, applicants who, particularly if you're applying for the first time, or even if you applied before you've been successful before, yeah, there, there, is, there is the support there, so you've only to come in. Well, let's push that door with a size 12 boot, shall we? Thank you very much, everybody. Right, uh, Tom. Yeah, I, mean, I agree with everything that Stuart said. Um, I think we've got a job of work to do here in Southampton because we've got to teach ourselves what our own history is. 
I don't think um, kids at school, people in the communities, have a great idea about the width and the breadth of Southampton's history, its background and its values. We're not just a city of Southampton football club, the Titanic, the Spitfire and Craig David. We've come in a lot more than that. But it's amazing how much people don't know. Absolutely amazing. And I really don't know why we don't actually take that information out there to schools, universities, colleges, community groups and whatever because there's a, a wealth of information that really we should really document because we really should be able to have all that history documented within the city. We should have, we should have films and videos and literature. I mean, I know that the Oasis Academy did a lot of work on the sort of ethnic history of Southampton going back hundreds of years. And that's kind of sat there somewhere and it's not being shared among schools. We did a great film called The Blackness in Southampton. It's about 12 minutes long, which should be shared among schools. We've got the histories of uh, um, black people in Southampton, uh, in my book, available at October Books and Publishing. <laughs> but um, apart from that, we need the histories of the Chinese community, the Sikh community, the Hindu community. We really should be publishing and putting that information together. And we're not doing that because if we don't do it, nobody else is going to do it. So we've got a job of work in making that happen because the more people know, the more people like Stuart will then be inundated with projects and ideas and thoughts saying, yeah, we really need a project on, let's say, for instance, uh, the seed community, the presence of the seed community in Southampton. People barely know there is a seed community in Southampton because the history has not been protected. That's a significant part of the city of Southampton. And the same thing goes with the Chinese community. People don't know anything about that, notwithstanding some of the older communities um, and in different parts of the city, like Wollstone, which of course used to trade in wool, and there's a great Viking connection. So you see, there's so much more that we don't know, but we've got to educate ourselves first. Why don't we have a project in which we're documenting our own history, sharing it within our own, with our own citizens and with our own communities, and use that as the foundation on which we then build the ideas to develop the history of the city. Because for me, that is what heritage is all about. Southampton has been a city that a lot of people have come into the city. They probably weren't born here. They come from other parts of the country, which is great. We welcome them all. I mean, I was there. I came from London many years ago. So I think we can all be people of Southampton and share pride in the city. But I think we really, as a city, need to develop that foundation of information. Every child in the city needs to know the good things about Southampton. I don't think they do. I really don't think they do. And that will be part of developing our identity and give the background on which we can then develop really fantastic applications that I'm sure that the Lottery Fund will have no other option than to say yes. <laughs> how, how confident are you that this will happen more quickly now that all these people are in this room over the last day? Is this going to speed things up? We've got to have a plan. The plan involves something to do with collecting all the information. I really don't know why we're not producing short films and videos about all of this stuff that can be shared in schools. We need to have an association with the, with the schools' bodies about how they will then share that information with their young people. You know, little kids in Southampton, they need to know that they're born in the city. They've actually got a history. Because even when we talk about you know, Henry V and Ashton Corps, you know, a lot of things know about. They need to know that it sailed from Southampton. They don't know that. They need to know that the great Benny Hill lived in Southampton. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, He's got the fun of it. He's buried in Southampton. Now you used to have the supermarket where he did shopping. But, um, so you see, there are lots and lots of information to find out that we don't know anything about. And this is stuff that I've just found out. And there's much more, and I'm sure the city archives have got vast amounts of information that can be shared with all of us. And of course the budget for the archives has gone down, so we need to invest a lot more in that in order to be able to then, you know, show that history across the board. So there's a lot of work to do, but we have to do that first. 
uh, and I, I was fascinated when you when we had a chat the other day and you gave that little booklet. Is it Muhammad Ali and Fine Fair? Yeah, Muhammad Ali was uh, was um, came down to Fine Fair supermarket uh, in between his, uh, his his boxing fights, and, uh, and there's a great clip on uh, on, on, the, on the BBC that uh, shows all of that. So Muhammad Ali in 1971, Bob Marley in 1973. Joe Harriet in the died in, in Bitten. So lots and lots of great stuff and uh, yeah, I think I, that uh, we can I, tell I, more stories. I mentioned that to a couple of colleagues and they went, What's fine fair? <laughs> <laughs> Those old so I, I could explain uh, that really. Yeah, I think it's called cool Safeways and Safeways and the Fine Fair all around by the same time. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, right, there's been a few, um, I don't know if we have a slide over. We do, we have two questions in the slide over. Sorry, I'm, I've got a like a shout. <laughs> Oh yeah, right, okay, give me two seconds and I'll, 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 I'll quite say. Uh, that's great, thank you very much. Um, we've had some in interesting answers there, there's some commentary that I'm sure you'll all reflect on later on, but there are some themes coming up. I've picked up two big ones that we are discussing as an organisation and with our partners, is the cruise ship business, those four million visitor journeys, and the connectedness of, of the city, and the potential, and the fact that I make a challenge to people, I say, point to something happened on the map, you talk about on the map, and they can, they get pretty much where it is. Tell me something about it. Shopping. Excuse my language, effing big IKEA. <laughs> and then they exhaust themselves with ex exhaustion of knowledge. <laughs> um, and I have um, somebody in the Royal Audience Service Centre for point to Lincoln. They struggle. So we're on the map, <laughs> just not on the map. Yeah. Um, right, uh, sorry, where's off my slide up? Sorry, I'm going to shout them up. Sorry. Okay, yeah, so the first one and most popular is how do you see heritage as a phenomenon of the present and future, and do the ghosts of the past flow through the present? There you go. Thank you. <laughs> 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 Can you come down? Yeah, I can come down. Can you come down, come down as well? Like <laughs> We are, we are sort of blinded by spotlights, so we can't see that. Yeah. So it was, how do you see heritage as a phenomenon of the present and future, and do the ghosts of the past flow through the present? So a lot of room for interpretation there. <laughs> Anybody want to kick off? Give a second, there's a job a few minutes. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick go. I mean, I've always believed that much of what I've said is about our past history. And in order to, to value what we have today, we've really got to value what we've done in the past. So it seems to me that the past always reflects the future. For instance, the manner in which we dealt with early migrants, the manner in which we dealt with communities back in the 60s, will help us to then determine what we did wrong, what we did right, and how we then deal with migrants in the here and now. So the past is a very important part of understanding whether we did things right or whether we did things wrong, and to look at them in the future. And also, again, if we look at the architecture of the past, it will help us to decide what went wrong. Well, Southampton was heavily bombed during the war, and some horrendous buildings came up after the war. So it will help us to decide what we didn't do right, and, what we now do in the future, and uh, whether it does reflect properly as we'd like to, is another matter for, uh, for, for reflection, I think. To take it in a slightly different direction, I agree completely with everything you're saying there, Don, but in terms of the role of heritage in the future, I think the heritage is an amazing sort of vessel as well to think, what does Southampton need today? Is, for example, the creative economy important to Southampton? What are the areas of potential growth, because certainly at Somerset House, where we use a lot of our space for creative startups, the people working in kind of pioneering new technologies, and they all, when you talk to them about what do they prize uh, about being based at Somerset House, it is the unexpected juxtaposition, and actually they talk about people uh, like doing business with them, visiting them because they're based at Somerset House, because there's something unexpected about it. So I think that's something we can really use the past to inform the kind of future. Um, completely different, and yes, I totally agree. Uh, because ours is a sort of private mm -hmm. enterprise within the building, we do carry the history with us. 
all the staff are trained mm -hmm. to give little tours. If you come in on a Friday night and I'm there and I see you looking upstairs and looking interested, I'll drive you around the building whether you want to go or not. <laughs> because we're really proud of what we've done. And I, I think you just have to love these spaces and try and open them up to the community, whether it's business or whether it's um, charitable, charitable businesses. And the people will come. If we open up these sites, they definitely will come. They're, people love being part of all of this. And Southampton is so rich. And I'm proud to be all of that. Actually, sure. Yeah, um, I think I would probably just go back to what I said earlier on, which is just making that connection between um, sort of how we how we draw on our sense of connection and value in the past, but making it relevant to, to the here and now. So mm -hmm. <coughs> really I'm repeating the point from earlier on, but I was talking about advocating for the power of heritage in the sense of the way in which it offers development of skills. I talked about its opportunities for um, creating and sustaining employment. I think, f for me, um, there's a kind of a, I think we, we, we've seen that you know, there's a real peril in um, uh, not really learning from the past as well. Um, and yeah, that's right. You can make money from the past. Yeah. People forget that. We've got loads and loads of tourists coming in every year. Do you make money from them? No. Yeah. The past is a wealth making business. And Southampton is one of the key areas that has got a lot of ways in which we can make money from that in terms of our history and in terms of the cruise line, the biggest cruise line port in, in, in Europe, perhaps. And uh, therefore we can make money from it. And we don't. And that could fuel the um, about the whole of this sort of history in the archive industry that we have in the city if we invest in it properly. We've got a few minutes, a couple of minutes left. Is it time for a big question? <laughs> it is a good question, and so I think we should have it. How do you think we engage underrepresented communities so that are involved in and write our heritage? So, this is a brief, yeah, brief answers. Who <laughs> start with Donald you can know. Well, I think we talk to them first. But, I Again, I sort of spoke earlier on about um, you know, the importance of empowering uh, local communities to identify heritage for themselves, to articulate to articulate it for themselves. So the in terms of with, with my kind of work hat on, it's all about me providing resources to do that and make it sustainable. Yeah, co-creation, co that's what um, we've advocated since Brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you. That's <laughs> <Just> a <laughs> slide up. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for our panel. Um, we are on uh, uh, the last minute or so of it. Um, anybody got any words of advice to pass across to our worthy audience? Anybody want to throw 20 seconds of advice to them? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it seems to me we need to have a plan. I don't think we can go into, you know, this issue of uh, the culture of the city without a plan about how we capture the imagination of ordinary members of the public. I don't think we've quite got that together yet. And for me, that's uh, an immediate priority. Right. Uh, right. Thank you very much, everybody. Can I ask you to thank very much uh, Don, Mandy, Stuart, and Diana for their uh, insights. And